In the next One Piece, Moria may have that shadowy girth, but Jinbei has these fat f***ing tits. <laughs> these wet floppers. That's what he calls his fins. That's what he calls his webbed hands. <laughs> King of the wet now's gonna take you down. Gonna take you down. We're in for the cats getting hot now. It's getting hot now. King of the what now's gonna take you down. Gonna take you down. Marine Ford Arcade's getting hot now. It's getting hot now. We've got a multi-act season. One, two, three. So come aboard to brave the sea. Supernovas and mystery. Warlords, wars, and tragedy. King of the what now's gonna take you down. Gonna take you down. Marine Ford Arcade's getting hot now. It's getting hot now. Celestial dragons, lowest of low. Overwhelming enemies, it's time to go. Boom. Luffy's gonna fight for his big bro. So now it's time to start the show. Boom. Hello, fellow soldiers of justice and piracy and, and family. And welcome to another episode of King of the What Now? Your only One Piece podcast covering the anime from the very beginning that also has One Piece themed cereal oh i would not recommend that you try the sanji flavor there was a terrible accident in the mixing lab and given who sanji is as a character <laughs> no don't, I want take, you to really don't go consider. in that direction okay i had to pick one of them okay and like if i picked any of the guys it could have been weird if i picked any of the girls it could have been weird. i wouldn't recommend the chopperos they're the ju- meat flavor the chopper puffs <laughs> <laughs> There's actual hair mixing for authenticity, and let me tell you, that doesn't mix well with the milk at all. Who are <laughs> you? Anyways, we're a One Piece podcast covering the anime from the very beginning. I already said that part, but I'm just, I'm out of my groove. I'm your host, Joel, longtime fan of the series, and uh, also, I am... Why do I do this every single time? I feel like I should have these prepared ahead of time. Hang can... on. Wait. I am seething with anger and i'm just gonna kick everyone in the head even if it blows my cover and costs me my job because that's how passionately i believe in kicking people with my with my long leggies and my very sharp heels with your big kickies i'm cat i'm the ghost of the show and i am a guy who just stabbed my father because he hurted my feelings <laughs> i was told that he didn't love me and i believed that i, I Believed the lie of a person who I know wants me dead over this relationship that I've had for like 20 years or however long Squard's been uh, so an ally. So stupid. Honestly, we should all just step on Squard, but not sexy. Derogatory. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Before we get into the episode, and before we even get into chatting with the hosts, uh, whenever we get a new pledger on Patreon, I always shout them out uh, on the show. Now, here's the thing. When I made that promise to myself, never actually codified it on the website, we only have the one podcast. I'm positive that this person subscribed for our Precure content, so I will shout them out twice. Once on the King of the What Now episode that they probably won't listen to, and if they do, that's cool, but then also on the Cure of the What Now episode. I, as the uh, as the official Cure of the What Now lead host, demand to get to do that shout out. Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. No, you're you're 100% the executive produce, producer of that. Uh, we'll get a little fancy name tag for your desk. No, somewhere. no, I'm the director. You're doing all the production. I don't know what the difference is. You do the editing uh, boops. Okay, yeah. Absolutely. Anyway, new patron! <laughs> Woo! Yeah, so thank you very much, Trillion Bones, for joining us, and your uh, support is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Now we can get into hosting with the chats. Yeah, absolutely. That's what we're doing. We're chatting with the cats. Uh, Sinatra, what do you think? Meow. Yeah, exactly. Wonderful audio. We recorded relatively recently, so have you been up to much lately? I finished my reread of Six of Crows. Okay. And I started on the sequel, which has a name. I don't remember. You Crooked always Kingdom. The name. What? Crooked Kingdom is the name of the sequel. Ah. And it's funny because when I started my reread of Six of Crows, I was like, did I even read the sequel? I don't I don't remember what the heist in that one was. Maybe I had been waiting for it to come out and I never read it. No, what I remembered as the climax of Six of Crows is actually the plot of Crooked Kingdom. Oh, okay. Very so, interesting. Also, 
No spoilers for you, but I know that there is pain coming in this book, and I'm not looking forward to it. Mm. There is a scene so painful that when I saw the author at Comic-Con, I had her sign that specific page so she would know that she wounded me. I, I remember you telling me that story when you were in line, but I don't remember anything else about it. She opened it to where I had it marked because I was like, oh, I marked the page. I wanted you to sign, please. And she opened it, and she looked at it, and she went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I haven't really been up to much of anything uh, lately, but I have been watching more Kira Kira Pre-Kira a la mode. Why did they pick such a long title for that show? Uh, if you want on Twitter, I have the hashtag Kira Kira Cotwin. Uh, it's not a lot of deep insights. It's not quite as, uh, as thoughtful as uh, Grant the Thief's threads that he does, but... Uh, I, I'm just posting screenshots of anything that's funny or anything that is a particularly good shot and just like losing my mind over how great this show is. I'm really curious how much crossover we get between our Precure audience and our One Piece audience. So, uh, I'm going to put a, a code word into both episodes. And if you send me the code word, I'll get back to you with something Wait, no, cool. no, no, but if you're putting the same code word in both of them, so what you need is two code words and they have to send them both to you. You're right. You're right. You're right. Okay. So the code word for the one, the Cotwin episode, the also king of the Also keep in mind now. that this episode is not going to air for like a couple of weeks. So the Cure of the What Now episode that we're going to record and release next week <laughs> is actually going to come out like two weeks before this one. Oh, I'm making it complicated. No, I'm making it complicated. You're making, you know what I'm going to do? Okay. I'm going to say in our pre-Cure episode that there is a a code word in one of the King of the What Now episodes that will be coming out. Okay. And if they find it, we'll know that And will it be this both. one while we have this It'll long conversation? It'll be this one. Yeah. Okay, so, okay. 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 So the, uh, the code word is Kirapow. <laughs> My code word is coconuts. What? Nothing. Don't look at me like that. This is a purely audio <laughs> format. I don't even know what looking at you is. Do not perceive me, human. <laughs> uh, I feel like we also, we watched a little bit of Zombieland Saga, but I think we, we covered that. Okay. We covered that. Um, you haven't watched any more Vivi. I haven't watched any more Pretty Boy Detective Club. The one thing that we've been watching a lot of is we've been watching our friend Andrew slash at Walrus Nostril on Twitter, stream Resident Evil 7. And these games are gross, but he is an entertaining streamer, and we're having a lot of fun with that. You know, absolutely. I will say it's no secret that I watch Game Grumps. That's how I got turned on to Danganronpa. Uh, but their playthrough of It Takes Two is just incredible. And I'm pretty sure it's finished. Uh, as of today, they've uploaded two episodes of a different game. So I think that's supposed to be a relatively short game. But it's a co-op game where you can mess with each other. And guess what? The Game Grumps are good at messing with each other. So it's been very good uh, commentary or comedy uh, in that area as well. Beautiful. I think with that, we can get into our succinct summary yes so we just got finished watching episodes 466 through 473 now as you remember the last episode we covered uh had luffy and all the others uh, escapees falling from the sky and everyone being like oh my god what happened so this very first episode it does a little bit of a flashback and it's revealed that because Whitebeard did the tsunami, they had to ride this wave, and they were above Marine Ford, but then because Okiji froze the water, they got stuck up there, and Luffy said, I got an idea, let's break the ice, we'll slide down the wave and go around, I guess was his original plan, but guess what, it doesn't matter, because when they break the ice, they accidentally fall the wrong way directly into Marine Ford. There's a question of how are they going to survive, and they ended up in the exact giant hole that Jozu had created when he decided to throw a giant ice block at uh, uh, Marine Headquarters. Why they could survive that is beyond me, because hitting water is actually not like some soft, spongy material, but who cares? It's an anime. Oh, I don't actually even remember exactly what the order of operations is. Luffy figures out where Ace is, he starts charging, and Jimbei and Ivan Koff are like his bodyguards. So anyone who attacks him, they try to run interference. He runs into some familiar faces. He runs into Django and Iron Fi Iron Body. Full body? Full body. Full body. Uh, he Full does body pot marine man. <laughs> Full body marine man. 
Luffy does not remember either of these two people, but uh, he's able to get past them easily enough because John Go accidentally puts them both to sleep with his hypnotism. Uh, he runs into Hina again, who can use her cage power and speaks in third person, and Luffy's able to use Gear Second to avoid the cage. Uh, Smoker shows up at one point, and Luffy still has no way of fighting this man made out of smoke, but luckily, Hancock is here, and she's able to stop him for reasons we'll get into outside of this succinct summary. Mori is here. He decides to try to mess with Luffy, but it turns out that uh, a shadow un man is no match for the first son of the sea. Uh, Jinbei just beats the crap out of him. Ivankov protects Luffy from Kuma, and it turns out they might have something of a past, huh? Aww. But also, Kuma's acting strange. Doflamingo gives us some dialogue. We'll get into that. And then that's basically it. Luffy does interact with Whitebeard immediately upon arriving at the battlefield and is basically like, hey, don't get in my way. And everyone watching is like, oh my god, Luffy, you can't say that. That's white. You can't just... What? Uh, and they basically treat each other as equals, more or less. And Whitebeard is... Uh uh, uh, encouraged by his chutzpah, his spirit. And so throughout the battle, occasionally other members of Whitebeard's crew will will help Luffy, that sort of thing. The pacifistas, do you remember the pacifistas from Sabayote Archipelago? They're here. There's a lot of them. They're shooting a lot of lasers. It's death and destruction all around. Pew, pew, get out. We're all going to die, and they're only attacking the allied pirates. We'll get into what the difference is between the allied pirates and the Whitebeard pirates, but... One of the most prominent members of the Allied Pirates gets pulled aside by Akane, who goes, Hey, so Whitebeard sold you all out. Watch the, the robots. They're not going to attack you. They're not going to attack him. They're going to attack the Allied Pirates. And you guys are screwed. You shouldn't have trusted in Whitebeard. I'm definitely trustworthy. And then he twirled his mustache and like kind of like sank back into the shadows going, uh, And Squared, for some reason, believes this and stabs Whitebeard. And he's like, you don't really love me, do you? And Whitebeard's like, you stupid idiot. Of course I love you. And Squared's like, what could I have no? And then Marco's like, is crying going to do anything to help anything? And Squared stays there and cries for a while longer. Yeah, because he's a pirate. He's been sailing the seas for many, many years. So he definitely knows to let his emotions get the better of him because that's the only way he's going to unlock his pre-cure powers, you yeah. know? Mihawk, I forgot to mention, he also briefly messes with Luffy, uh, but he is saved by first Jimbei. Jimbei's not very good against swords, it doesn't seem. And then by uh, Flower Vista, who's, I think, the fourth division commander of the Whitebeard Pirates. I know some of the names, but I do not know specifically what squads they lead. He's either fourth or fifth, I think. What squads they lead? <laughs> uh, and then Sengoku has also been turning off all of the Denden Mushi. He wants to cut the broadcast, kill Ace early, turn on the broadcast and say like, hey, nothing suspicious happened. We won. Yeah, he's basically worried that if they see the fighting, they're going to be like, oh, man, the Marines are being pretty rough on these pirates. Yeah, he's trying to garner sympathy by using underhanded tactics. Gee, I wonder if we've ever seen underhanded tactics used by other members of the Marines throughout this series, and if that's part of the themes of the ongoing story. One Piece is political, though. Buggy manages to secure one of the Denden Mushi, and so some information that Sengoku was trying not to get out gets out anyways. But then Aokiji freezes Buggy, and that's the end of these episodes. So that has been your not so succinct summary. One more point that you missed, but I think is important. The Marines basically tried to make an encircling wall and trap the pirates... Yes. But they didn't succeed. They they mostly succeeded, but there's one part of the wall that hasn't quite gotten up yet, and that's because Orz Jr.'s body is... See, I thought it was because his body was so big, and I think that might be part of it, but also he his blood like went into the machinery and like clogged it up or it something It janked like that. the mechanism, yeah. So did you like these episodes? I like these episodes a lot. There are certain parts that I could do without, um, my dislike for Buggy is, I can't say it enough. I, sometimes I tolerate him. Sometimes I'm like, okay, other people like Buggy. I don't like Buggy, but you know, different, different strokes for different folks. Maybe there's someone out there who doesn't like Sanji as much as I do. So maybe they have to put up with Sanji more than, than they're willing. And I get the treat of more Sanji. But the longer he continues to be like, we've got to run away. And all of these pirates are like, oh my God, he said, we're going to save the day. Like, it's kind of funny, but it's really annoying because it actually makes me feel like the world is run by idiots. I, yeah, I don't like the 
over the top, exaggerated, haha, isn't it funny how stupid this character is kind yeah. of bit. And so, especially when Buggy was on camera and he was trying to announce himself to the world, like him messing up and having to pause and redo his makeup and whatever, like that was just annoying. Yeah. Like he's not good at fighting, but at least have him be good at being like, haha, I'm here, I'm Buggy, look at what is happening behind me. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, is Buggy dead? Well, Robin got frozen and she wasn't dead. And neither was Luffy? Neither uh, was Luffy, but uh, Aokiji said you have to thaw them out quickly enough. And who's there to thaw Buggy out? Well, at the same time, Akainu did just launch a bunch of lava. At the same time, if you're frozen and unable to dodge and a glob of lava lands on you, I assume that would be bad. Um... I'm going to say that at this moment, we can't definitively say whether Buggy is alive or dead. He's probably alive, but things aren't looking good. You don't want to be frozen in the middle of a battlefield where three admirals and seven warlords and an, an emperor of the sea are and all And a partridge in a gosh dang pear tree? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. You know what other joke I did not like? Was it Hancock? Yeah. Yeah. We're tired of that. I get the I get the feeling that this is filler. Um one of these days maybe we'll actually read the manga chapters along with the episodes that we're watching. I did that for one episode back in Thriller Bark and I should really start doing that again. Right. But my point is is that she sees Luffy and there's this long extended sequence where she imagines her wedding day and she imagines like cooking food for him and stuff and like I get it, but at the same time, it's like, this is, this is too much. It's not funny. It's not adding to the episodes. It's making me want to, like, go watch something else that has better pacing or, or something like that. Also, I know Hancock kind of alluded to the fact that she doesn't care if she loses her Shichibukai status, but Granny Neon was very, like, you need that status and the protection it offers because you don't want to make an enemy of the Marines. So, Boa Hancock stepping in and attacking Smoker, and saying, I won't let you attack my beloved, right after she saved Luffy. Like, if she attacked him and she said something like, you're too crass, or I don't like the fact that you're smoking, or she made so uh, if she made up some stupid reason, you could at least say, like, okay, that makes sense. But it seems like she is literally throwing away her title, and I just wonder if there's going to be fallout from that or not. Yeah, absolutely. At the same time, she did say the line about, like, I was ordered to appear... Not yeah. anything else. So maybe the reasoning is that the Marines are just so bureaucratic that they're not going to fire her over this because they're going to look at our paperwork and be like, well, we didn't tell her not to attack Smoker. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, there was like a really extended scene of her moaning while the camera just like stayed yeah. on her chest. And like, Oda, I get it. You're horny for women, but... You know, there's other cool stuff going on that I would rather focus on right now. Absolutely, for sure. So, Catherine, same question to you. How did you like these episodes? Yes. <laughs> so, like you said, there was a lot that felt extra, um, and there was a lot to keep track of. Like, this is easily the biggest One Piece has gone so far in the series. Oh, for sure. But I think that there were a lot of moments with Doflamingo that were really good. There were a lot of moments with Whitebeard that were really good. His response to Squard and embracing him, even mm -hmm. though Squard stabbed him and could have cost them the battle. Like, that's, that's really cool. That tells me what kind of guy Whitebeard is. And it's in line with him insisting that he told Ace to go after Blackbeard and that this is his fault. Like, he is a man who takes responsibility for his quote-unquote sons. Yes. And he doesn't care how stupid they are. It, it was so good. I do think it's kind of funny, knowing that Squad's going to stab Whitebeard, uh, which you could have predicted might have happened based off the fact that Squad disappeared and there was even a scene where they explicitly were like, hey, where's Squad? Has anyone seen him? But having already seen these episodes and then going back and watching them again... It's interesting that when Squard's like, hey, you really know Sengoku, huh? Like, you really know how he thinks. And Sengoku just kind of says, like, or no, not saying, sorry. Whitebeard says, yeah, I've known him for a long time. Like, he doesn't give an answer that, like, would assuage Squard's fears. And Whitebeard doesn't know Squard has fears. But it's just interesting that he an answered in such a, like, a kind of cryptic way <laughs> that made it even easier for, for Squard to go through with the betrayal. But... It's funny because there's 16 division commanders. Uh, I guess only 15 now that, well, 14 because 
Ace has been captured, and I don't know if they've had a chance to replace Thatch, who was killed by Blackbeard. But we got a backstory for Squad, so I'm wondering, are we going to get 14 more backstories? Are we going to get one for Jozu and one for Vista and one for Marco? I, I just, I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I am curious about Marco a little yeah. bit. Marco's got some stuff. He's got some bits and pieces. Marco's one of those characters, kind of like Jimbe, where at this point where we are in the manga... I have forgotten what it is about Marco that made people so obsessed with him because he's not quite the same if he shows up again in the future. But it's the he's the pineapple head. It's like it that's is, the answer. It's absolute, well, in the blue fire, and but he's really cool in these episodes, and he's got an attitude, and he's mm-hmm. like he's the cool big brother uncle man. So I've been enjoying uh, Marco a lot. Yeah, I don't know if each of the divisions have different responsibilities is number one, the administration squad, and number two is the assassination squad. Is this just a bleach reference? Or is it like a power ranking thing? But Marco is the first division commander, and I think that that holds a special meaning over the other 15, insofar as I think that Marco counts as like the vice captain of the ship, even though I don't think that's a recognized position on most of the pirate crews. And you can tell he's like constantly talking to Whitebeard, trying to strategize. Uh, he was the he was the first one to like kind of intercept Squad after he attacked and that sort of thing. And he's the one who gave the like pick yourself up and stop crying, you sniveling little baby. So if any of them were to get more of a backstory, it wouldn't surprise me if it were Marco. Absolutely. We got a ton of information in this uh, in these episodes. And I actually, that's kind of one of the reasons why I like it, because it feels like you're actually, you have a mix of characters you've seen before, Crocodile, and you know a little bit about Ivankov and that sort of thing, but you also have a bunch of new characters. You have uh, uh, Akainu, and you have Squard, and you have all these other division commanders. And so I that's kind of what I like about it, but it also makes it a little hard for me personally to talk about because like oh my god there's so many of these different pieces and like you could technically say that uh Jimbe fighting Moria technically had to happen before Luffy could fight and lose to Mihawk or almost die against Mihawk so there is a sequentiality to it but at the, in the abstract it kind of feels like it's a bunch of random things you know Luffy fighting Smoker could have happened before or after he ran into Moria and it wouldn't affect the overall arc of the stories absolutely but I think you have a starting point in mind. I did. So Kuma arrives, and we know that it's Kuma because he's the one carrying the Bible. And he has the pawpaw fruit. And he has the... Does he use it? I couldn't remember. Uh, he used it briefly against the new Kama uh, at the very beginning of the battle. He's not currently using it against Ivankov. He's using the mouth laser He's instead. using the laser. Okay. But he arrives, and it turns out that he isn't Kuma anymore. (laughs) Um, And Daffy explains that the real Kuma volunteered to be a guinea pig uh, for a study to build a human weapon, Mm -hmm. and that Vegapunk had performed the last operation to fully convert him into a weapon. And you have a scene from Luffy who's overhearing this where he's like, oh, that's why that guy said we wouldn't meet again. Yep. Because he's not in there anymore. He's just a shell. But Ivan is horrified by this because it turns out that Ivankov and Kuma somehow knew each other. Yeah, so here's the thing. The relationship between Kuma and Ivankov is not stated. We know basically nothing about Kuma. He's he's appeared a couple of times, but he basically says nothing. He seems to be fairly loyal, but it seems like maybe if he's some kind of a robot, maybe his programming makes him loyal. But the only two things we know about Ivankov is Ivankov's relationship with the Revolutionary Army and Ivankov's uh, being the the queen or the king of New Kama Land, New, New, New Baka? One of them is, I think it's New Kama Baka, Baka Kingdom. Kingdom. Kama Baka Kingdom, right, sorry. So, you know, maybe Kuma used to be different. Maybe when uh, they were younger, he needed like uh, growth hormones or something. Maybe that's why he's such a big boy, or maybe he used to be a, a woman. But it seems more likely... That it's the, the he's connected to the revolution. Or well, and what about, what I was gonna say when I was explaining how Ivan was horrified by this was he specifically said, "No, that can't be right." Kuma hates the government, right? So if Kuma hates the government and he and Ivan had some sort of relationship, I think you can assume he was either involved with the revolutionaries or they had similar goals at least at one point. Like they've they've ran into each other and they were allies for a moment or something like that. Absolutely. I also thought it was really fun 
funny because when Kuma looked at Ivan, he saw the female version of Ivan and like matched it up to Ivan Kov's giant man head. Yeah, the hair, I think, was similar enough that it's like, okay, this is the same person. Exactly, and the eye makeup and everything. You looked at that and you went, oh, was was Ivan Kov originally a woman and injects himself to look like this for when he's fighting or whatever? And I looked at this and I thought, those two... They were being nasty with each They've other. They've had a relationship or whatever. Yeah. yeah. My only thing is, is that I don't know if they would allow Kuma to retain his memory. I know you're being silly, and it's it's very funny to imagine uh, Kuma and Ivankov just like, all right, we finished the mission. We, we saved a country from war. Now it's time to do the deed. But... I think in all re- reality, it seems like Kuma probably does not have his previous personality, and he does not have his memories, so instead he's probably connected to the same database that was able to determine that Usopp was secretly Soka King. And so, I just assume that maybe Ivankov was uh, born as a woman, and now prefers uh, their male form most of the time. I could also see Ivan using his female form for, like, espionage work. Uh, okay. And I could see that being when he got arrested. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So, but- We don't know... Sorry, I just... One more quick question on this. We don't know much about Kuma. We believe Ivankov when Ivankov says Kuma hates the government. Why would someone who hates the government, known as the tyrant when, they're in, when they were a pirate, agree to submit to this experiment? Maybe he's under some kind of duress. Yeah, I think that's the one that makes the most sense. If he were captured and they told him that he could either become a uh, a human weapon or he could rat out the revolutionaries, I could see... I mean, we don't know what his personality was like, but I could see that being some kind of a choice that's forced upon him. I do also want to point out, you said that they've been, built, they've been modifying him over time. Doffy did specify they've basically been doing it like bottom up. So at first it was just the legs and then they replaced the arms. Uh, and then the last thing they replaced was the head. And that's when, uh, the quote unquote real Kuma, the, the, the living Kuma, uh, is now gone. But is it really? Hmm. (laughs) One Piece seems like the show that could pull the, the real you is still inside there sort of thing. Or maybe they'll find like a floppy disk that has his brain and upload Kuma back into the robot. But I think that this character is going places, uh, beyond just, shooting lasers at Ivan Kof during the battle. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, that's pretty much all I had to say on the Kuma stuff. The one other piece of information we had written down that is sort of new information, but sort of not, is that um, we, we knew that Logia Devil Fruit users could be stopped, right? We saw Rayleigh somehow stop Kizaru. Kizaru. And we knew that Luffy was taking damage from Sentamaro during their battle. Uh, Chopper and R- Robin both were like, but he's supposed to be made out of rubber. Right. So we saw Hancock fight Smoker, and she was able to land physical blows on him despite him being made of smoke. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, so he commented, he's like, this must be that Kuja hockey, which is really interesting because we know for a fact that Rayleigh has hockey, and Rayleigh is definitely not a woman from Amazon Lily. Uh, so I think maybe the world knows the Kuja pirates or the Kuja uh, island as these fierce warriors, and they know that they have this ability called hockey, and maybe it's rare for so many people in on a single island to possess whatever ability this is. But, yeah, it, uh, we get confirmation that apparently you can strike Logias. And I'd actually honestly forgotten that Rayleigh had blocked Kizaru's attack, because I was about to make the argument, maybe Oda is telling us that it works on Logias, because we only had seen it against a Paramecia before. But, I don't know. I don't know. We also got a ton of new characters, but I don't feel like listing them all. I don't think most of them are important. Uh, no. A Kanu is really the most important one. Yeah, and he technically showed up in the last set of episodes we watched. I will say that something about the way Akainu is built, I think it's th- his, that his neck and his face is a little bit broader than uh, the other two string beans, the Ice Boy and the Light Boy, but he feels the most Grandpa-esque to me. Something about the way that he's drawn, he feels like he's kind of the oldest of the three, and maybe that's just his very serious demeanor. But... Imagine him throwing a punch at Luffy and it's labeled something like, um, millennials just don't want to work hard. And then Luffy's dodging and he's got the angry eyes and he's like, okay, boomer, as he's punching back. (laughs) I think the show ultimately is 
the most okay boomer of all of the main shonen stuff that I've been, you know, reading and watching for my entire life. Yeah, it's kind of like people who defend the status quo versus people who are trying to reach for something new. And wouldn't you look at it, there's a generational divide. Yeah, well, look at look at this war that we're in. This this feels like a kind of uh, closing thought we should save maybe towards the end when the war is like resolved and we are moving on to the next arc. But Whitebeard, Sengoku, Garp, these three individuals were around in Rogers' heyday. And they represent the old guard. And regardless of which side wins in this war, it's going to be a definitive turning point. Doffy has been nonstop talking about this new age that's coming, and he thinks that this is a turning point in history. And so they're literally passing the torch uh, to the next generation. Luffy and Ace are here to represent that generation. Absolutely. And I was going to save this for the discussion questions section, but these episodes, especially the the last couple, made it very clear that Whitebeard came here to die. He ripped off his medical equipment. There was a flashback to that. And he said, what, do you expect me to try to get pity from them by wearing this stuff? And I believe he had a thought about like, I'm gonna go out fighting and... It was after he got stabbed, he said something about, like, they will say that I'm a... They can call me a demon or a monster, but in the end, I'm just a person. I can't deny that I am weakening in my old age. So long as I can save that young man, in reference to Ace, I can step down. I don't know if he's come here to die, but I think he's come here to have one last hurrah where, you know, he lets his successors take over or something like that. Yeah, well, and and consider Gold Roger, right? I assume as one of his contemporaries, Whitebeard knew what was going on with Gold Roger with him being sick, Mm -hmm. and he saw the way that he took control of his own death and made it happen on the global stage and set off this new wave of piracy. So maybe Whitebeard came here partially because he wanted to save Ace, but partially because he knew it was going to be this huge televised event, and he was like, I can do something dramatic with my death the way that Roger did with his. I can can claim uh, ownership over my own death. Mm, Very nice. And That's so beautiful because you get one person who was inspired to take action because of another. Uh, This show has a big thing about inherited will, and I wouldn't say that we exactly get that in these episodes, but we do kind of get hints of it insofar as Whitebeard trying to help Ace become the Pirate King, if it's to be believed. I don't think Whitebeard said it himself, but a lot of people were speculating that that's what he wanted to do, was he wanted to put Ace on the throne of Pirate King. And if Whitebeard truly is going to retire, then yeah, I think I think that this arc goes a lot into the deeper themes of One Piece. And I think the fact that it's such a big arc with so many characters that happened to pop up right as Luffy was about to hit the red line, the canonical halfway point to Raftal. I, I, I think that, uh, you know, it, it's, 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 uh, it's, a, it's time for Oda to remind us about the overt themes of the series as we get ready for whatever the heck the new world is going to be. Absolutely. Now, did you have any favorite scenes or quotes from these episodes? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's quite a few that I love. What I really like is that Mihawk at one point, badass music starts playing and he unsheaths his sword slowly and he's he's approaching Luffy and he says, sorry, red hair, I can't let this boy slip by. I'm going to have to see if he's strong enough to overcome my blade. Let me see. Now, I wonder if fate will end the life of the child of the next generation here, Mihawk, as he prepares to attack Luffy. So, you know, we already knew that Mihawk and Shanks know each other and they have kind of like a rivalry, but also kind of like a friend, best friend thing going on. And so at some point, Mihawk was like, you know what? I'm not going to attack Luffy. But now that Luffy's here, he's like, let's see. And, you know, Luffy canonically weak to slicing blows. Mihawk really good at slicing stuff. And they're attacking. And it's just very interesting to see the way that Mihawk talks. He, he invokes, you know, fate. And as he's attacking and Luffy is jumping back to not get attacked, Mihawk is saying, you're getting further and further away from your brother. And so it's like, oh, what's going to happen here? And at one point, Luffy's preparing to use his gum gum bazooka and blast Mihawk away. And he gets a flash of his arms getting cut off and he diverts his attack in a different direction. He's like, what the hell was that? So Catherine, what the hell was that? What the hell was that? This is the first time we've seen anybody have that kind of moment of insight 
Yeah, I can't really think of anything else. Uh, I mean, Luffy has always been a creature of instinct. Remember when he fought Mr. Three on the island and there were a bunch of clones and Luffy was able to punch the right one? But, like, there's a difference between instinct and literally seeing something that hasn't happened. Absolutely. I feel like... There, there were moments earlier where people could sense one another's killing intent yeah. in this series. And I wonder if that's almost what this was. Sure. Like, Mihawk's killing intent is so powerful that it actually gave Luffy a vision of what would happen if he got close to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you give... I think we've made jokes about this before, but would you give Luffy psychic powers? I don't think it works for his play style at all. No, absolutely not. If I were going to give anybody psychic powers, it'd probably be Robin. Robin or Chopper, I think, would make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So let's really quickly segue into something else. This also touches on larger themes of the series. Mihawk literally said, I need to see if fate will end the life of this child. And we also know that... Uh, Blackbeard has uh, the doctor guy, Doc Q, I think his name is, who gives out apples to people and some of them randomly explode. And he thinks that people who don't explode have good fortune on their side. We saw Basil Hawkins, the magician, uh, one of the supernova, playing with tarot cards. And those seem to be more like probabilities than actual magic. But is fate a thing in this series? And more importantly, because short answer, I think, think yes most of most shonen series have some like level of fate behind it but like how do you write fate well how, without making it seem like oh luffy was just going to win because that's what the god wanted that's that's a really good discussion question because i was going to say i if fate is a driving force in one piece i would really like to see oda subvert it in some way Because Luffy's whole thing is that he's the freest man in the seas, or he wants to be, right? He wants to be Pirate King. But if you're just a puppet being controlled and whipped around by fate, then there's no freedom in that. You haven't done anything. So I can very much see Luffy rejecting the idea of fate and being like, it was our adventures together that brought us here, and fate had nothing to do with it. Isn't it funny that he fought God in like the third major arc of the series? Because... Saying, you know, I won't let fate decide what I'm going to do has a very, like, JRPG fighting God as the final boss feel to it. But maybe, because Enru isn't the real God, maybe something like that will happen at the end, and that was kind of like a sneak peek. Uh, Oda was testing out the idea of, of fighting a deity. Absolutely. One way that I think you can do fate well is maybe there is an ultimate destination, right? Mm. But maybe there are a hundred paths you could potentially walk to get there. Yes. And it's the path that you chose that's important, not the place where you end up. Yeah. I alluded that Hawkins doesn't do magic. It seems to be probabilities, you know, percent uh, uh, percentage of successful escape, 12%. Uh, chances of death, uh, 14%, that sort of thing. So maybe that is how fate works. Maybe Luffy has a 20% chance of defeating Crocodile without dying, and he managed to somehow win those odds against all odds. And then the next place he goes, he has, you know, a one in three chance of this happening. So you're saying everything that happens to Luffy so far has been a gotcha roll. (laughs) Something like that. But let let me extrapolate even further. Wouldn't it be interesting if Luffy was destined, maybe, uh, if fate's a real thing, if he was fated to come to Marineford? But then, what if... He had a very high chance of dying if he came alone, but if he brought Jimbe and Ivankov, maybe his chances go up a little bit. Maybe if he shows up with Crocodile, his chances go up a little bit. Because as you remember, when they first entered uh, Reverse Mountain, they had one of seven paths to go, and they picked the one because Vivi needed their help. And that brought them to Crocodile. And if Luffy hadn't met Crocodile, Crocodile wouldn't have been impaled down. So I don't know how well you can do that as a author. You have to be very careful to not make it seem like everything was preordained, but maybe Luffy has somehow managed to collect all of the right pieces to maximize his chances of success, and that's how he gets through, and he only gets those allies because of his own hard work. I like that a lot, and that actually leads me to one of my other favorite quotes, not just from these episodes, but from the series as a whole. So Mihawk is observing Luffy's 
frantic run uh, and how everybody is jumping in the way to help him and fight off the people in his way. And this is right after Mihawk was about to kill Luffy and then Visa showed up and was like, hello, I will be your opponent. Mihawk's like, where did you come from? (laughs) And Mihawk says... It's not because of his power or skills. He seems to rally all those around him to his side. Among all people on the sea, he has the most formidable ability. And yeah, that's what we've been saying about Luffy this whole time. He makes friends and allies everywhere he goes because he genuinely wants to improve the lives of the Mm -hmm. people he sees. He doesn't even want that. Luffy is not a character who cares about improving anybody's life. Luffy sees injustice and it makes him mad, so he punches. And other people are like, well, yeah, we don't want injustice being done right now. We'll throw some punches. Yeah, I was about to say, he fights the bullies that are in their way, but then basically just kind of Fs off unless they ask for help. Read my mind. Let's see if you can get it. What quote am I thinking of from early One Piece that represents Luffy and the allies that he collects along the way? Nope. I can't cook. I can't cut, Uh, I can't uh, navigate, and I can't lie. Luffy is one of those characters that uh, it feels like a trope, but I actually can't think of it right now, but it's main character useless without friends. Uh, And some of the movies have dealt with him potentially losing his friends or that sort of thing, and we've seen that it affects him in a very profound way. So I think that him gathering allies of increasing strength for some reason uh, is is very unique to making him, you know, Luffy rolls nat 20s on his charisma roll like every single time. And it's interesting to see that power come into play. Absolutely. Do you want to talk about the boyfriends that we met in these episodes? Yes. So Crocodile is trying to challenge Whitebeard and Whitebeard has no interest in Crocodile. He basically calls him like, you stupid kid. I should point out, I forgot in the succinct summary, right when they arrive, everyone knows that Crocodile is missing. Luffy sees that Crocodile is about to attack Whitebeard from behind and actually defends Whitebeard. And he's like, Ace loves this guy. Don't you, don't you freaking dare. And after Squard stabbed Whitebeard, Crocodile is like, I don't remember losing to some unimportant, you know, some weak link. Exactly. Yes. So Crocodile's having a lot of emotions. And in strolls Doffy, who's like, hee hee, we're both warlords, Crocodile. Don't you think it would be more fun if you were on my team? Do you want to come play with me? And Crocodile's like, fuck off, my guy. Put your tongue back in your mouth. And Doffy laughs and he says, you have a dirty mouth. Such a horny scene. Like, I know it's not meant to be, but gosh, maybe it's just Doflamingo. Like, everything he does just exudes horny energy. He belongs in jail. Yeah, he's a really unique guy, always laughing, ba- uh, power level unknown or battle ability unknown from the from the past episode. But it is interesting that this fighting is going on. He seems to know some of the secrets of Kuma, when you know he revealed it to Ivankov but he also said I don't know the details so I don't know does he follow the rumors does he read the newspapers does he sneak around does he have an informant something is going on with him Oda is waiting to reveal it but it feels almost like there's some connection between Doffy and Crocodile almost like if Luffy fought Doflamingo later in this very arc as he's going to save Ace I wonder if it would be Crocodile who interferes and tells Luffy to go save his brother. Well, and why do you think that they wanted, why do you think Doflamingo wanted to team up with Crocodile specifically of all the people that are on this battlefield? Why was it him he approached? Well, let's look at all of the different uh, warlords because he said, you know, even though you got kicked out, we're still both warlords. Uh, Jimbe is incredibly honorable. So if Doffy is up to no good, and you can assume he's up to no good, Jimbe wouldn't agree. Kuma's a robot, and even before that, he wasn't very interesting as a person, so Doffy wouldn't approach that. Hancock and Mihawk both want to be left alone, it seems like. Moria is uh, a brat and not that strong, to be honest. So I wonder if Doffy is looking for someone who has the drive to become, like, the next rising star in the in the pirate world. And maybe he knows that Crocodile... Uh, has lost a little bit of his status by losing to Luffy. So maybe Doffy thinks that Crocodile's in a place of weakness, of vulnerability, and is like, come work for me and you'll get all of your former glory back. I could see that. You know what else I could see? 
What's that? Crocodile knows about ancient weapons and poneglyphs and taking over countries. Like yeah. maybe Doffy is after some kind of power that he knows Crocodile understands. I mean, if he believes in power, and it certainly seems like that Doffy is a might makes right kind of guy. Maybe he wants to have that in place before the new age comes or something like that, right? Even if Whitebeard or Akainu or Sengoku were to die, it, I think it would take time for those reverberations to get through the world. So maybe Doffy is like preparing for whatever comes next. Yeah, I could absolutely see that. The other big warlord clash that we had was the Jinbei versus Moria fight. <laughs> which was a pretty cool fight. It was really good. Moria brings up a bunch of zombies and Luffy's having a hard time getting past them because they feel no pain and they can just keep getating back up again. But who comes in but Jinbei himself? He uses his fishman karate or jujitsu. I think we figured out that karate is above uh, ground uh, or above water. He basically can uh, water bend salt water into the mouths of all the zombies and immediately purify them. And Moria's like, I'm going to kick your butt. And he absorbs a bunch of shadows and he becomes bigger. And he's like, behold, my ultimate... <laughs> because Jimbei just decks him in the stomach. And Jimbei's just like, you need more discipline. Or, no, hang on. But getting stronger by taking other people's power doesn't make you any better, Moria. Mm -hmm. Moria never actually learned or grew as a person. He just took from other people and that's why he's still losing. I believe that Moria can one day regain the hotness that he had in his youth and punch people to death, but he has to believe in himself. And right now he's sitting on the couch. He's got the Dorito dust all over him. He hasn't showered in three days. Pick yourself up, boy. You, 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 you got this, Moria. We believe in you. Absolutely. Now I do have two small complaints about this fight. Yeah. Complaint number one is that Jinbei's attack naming scheme does not seem to be consistent. And I find that very annoying. Yeah, I have, I, I can't follow. I like it when people have themes for their attacks. Like if they were all shark themed, that would be cool. But one of them is like brick house. <laughs> I get it, Jimbei, you're stacked. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that some of his attacks are references to uh, Kurubi, the guy that Sanji fought. But I did not go back and verify that as I had wanted to. Could you imagine if you had two podcast hosts that actually put in like 50% more effort? I think we'd explode. Honestly. Yeah, we, we already put in enough effort that it's hard to uh, find time to write down our thoughts and watch the episodes and do the podcast and also live. Yeah. And so I feel like if we wanted to put in like 50% more effort, I feel like we'd have to quit our jobs. Yeah. <laughs> Hire uh, an intern named uh, Tim, you know? Absolutely. Now, the other small nitpick that I had with this fight do you remember Moria's powers having specific rules on Thriller Bark? Uh, let's see. Uh, he can take the shadow off of other people. Uh -huh. And if that person was exposed to sunlight, they would die because they don't have a shadow. And uh, if you put uh, salt in the mouth of any zombie corpse that's being animated via shadow, uh, the shadow will be expelled. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I also, I thought I remembered that zombies could only move around at night. Now, you have said you don't know whether that's true or not. Maybe they only moved around at midnight because it was spooky and they were into the spooky theming. But I don't know. So, the soldiers who Morio took their shadow out of, they didn't die. They didn't turn to dust and float away. They didn't, I don't feel so good, Mr. Stark, into the distance. <laughs> Yeah, so I did, I did, I did, I did a quick Google, uh, and it turns out that someone asked four years ago on the One Piece Reddit. They're like, "What the heck?" And there's several people that are like, "Yeah, it's a plot hole." And there's one person who was like, "Wasn't it cloudy the entire time?" What a cop out if that's the case. We, you, I would prefer that Moria say something like, "Yes, perfect, key, she, she, she." Yeah, the clouds have blocked the thing. Even, uh, even with the shadow of the walls is enough for us to operate. Yeah, like a, a throwaway line like that. Um, yeah, I, I, what I would, what I would assume is that Mario would be like, they invited me into Marine headquarters and they obviously wanted me to be my strongest. So I kidnapped 200 people, 200 Marines before the battle started and I stole their shadows and they're locked in the cupboard or something. See, that would have been fine. I would have been fine like that. I really did appreciate that Moro had, Moro. Moria had all his shadow zombies underneath and they like dug their way up. Yes, of course. Moria's an awesome villain and I love him and Thriller Bark is still one of the best. The only way that this battle could have been even more tense was if that if we had Foxy and if 
Django had not been nerfed at half power. You know, if he was fighting at full power, I think we would have, this battle would have gone a completely different way. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we've got one more favorite quote that was written down and it actually kind of goes with one of our quick notes, I think. So the note was Luffy doesn't care about the rules of pirates, right? Right. And Whitebeard says to Squard, if you're a pirate, you pick what you want to believe on your own. Now, to be clear, that wasn't just a squad. He was shouting that to like all of the pirates, because here's the thing. The allied pirates were being attacked by the pacifistas and they were getting eliminated because these robots are super strong and they were trapped by the giant ice wall. So when Squad was like, hey, we're dying ice walls, Whitebeard went, got you, bro. And he broke the ice walls and he was like, you can leave. Well, I left but, that Navy ship untouched just for you. Right. But if you are a pirate, pick what you want to believe on your own. And yeah, that, that's I think that's incredible. I really like how consistent the ideology is across the strongest pirates in this series, including Luffy. Yeah. So I just thought that was neat. Whitebeard's whole conversation with Squard we've already covered was just real nice. I don't know if you are very familiar with the uh, prodigal son story in the Bible, but it gave me big prodigal son vibes. And I like that Whitebeard is the kind of person who will embrace his prodigal son instead of pushing him away. It's really funny. You said, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the prodigal son. And my brain went, trope? Of course I'm familiar with the prodigal son trope. And then he went, story from the Bible. And I went, mm, no, I don't know that one. I know I know that how it's used in fiction, right? But I just, I never really read the Bible. So I don't know how it applies specifically to... Long story short, a guy had a son who decided to run off and spend a bunch of money and basically mess around. And eventually he came home and he was all broke and bedraggled and he expected his dad not to take him in. But his dad was like, put my finest cloak on him and bring him my finest concubines and cook him my finest sheep. My son is home. This is wonderful. Why did he have so many porcupines? I don't understand. <laughs> a concubine, That's... Joel, is a uh, woman used for sexual pleasure. Wow, that's so weird and not related to One Piece at all. Also, <laughs> the guy, so this, the son left for a little while and he messed around and then he came back. Isn't that also the plot of where the wild things are? No. No? It, okay. Because no, he only went in his mind. Uh, oh! I think. He's, he's, a, he's an astral projector, like Doctor Strange. That's so cool. Put the where the wild things are, kid, in the next Doctor Strange movie. Marvel, you cowards. All right, so can I assume that's our final thought, since you're just, like, way running off the edge of this cliff? <laughs> I, sorry. Uh, no, I'm, I'm not ready to go. I'm sorry. I, these two will be quick, okay? First, Whitebeard... Decide he uses this like incredible attack that like seems to make some people think that the world is turning upside down and like it cuts the ocean into like weird plane pieces, not plane flying planes, but you know, like a plane physics or whatever. But this this shockwave goes out and everyone's like, oh, it's gonna destroy the scaffolding that Ace is on top of. But when the smoke clears, everything's destroyed except the scaffolding, and in front of it stand the three admirals. Now QG. Kizaru, uh, Makano, they all have their arms out and they seem to have created a force field. Now, if you are familiar with the rest of One Piece, I assume most of you are, you might recognize what that is now after 400 more episodes have gone by. If you're new to One Piece, that does get explained. It's going to be a while, <laughs> but just keep it in the back of your mind in case you ever seen anyone else do anything else that resembles a force field or some kind of like force energy it's not dials i can tell you that much but that would be cool as well i miss dials dials are so neat yeah i think the government officially doesn't believe that sky islands exist and so i don't think that they could give the marines those uh, those items that's fair can't have the peasantry dreaming of whimsy <laughs> Now get back to providing for the government or we will burn you alive with lava. I can't even standing right behind you. <laughs> Here's another thing. And I want to hear your thoughts on it. Okay. Mihawk's attacking Luffy through various reasons. Buggy is in the sky being attacked by one of Crocodile sand tornadoes. Luffy grabs Buggy, pulls him down. Mihawk cuts Buggy and it acts as a shield, even though I'm pretty sure Mihawk's sword is big and sharp enough that it could have killed both of them. So it was Luffy ducking that saved his life. I don't understand that. I have seen the opinion on Twitter that even though we have seen people have the abilities to negate devil fruit powers, 
uh, attacks worked on Luffy, attacks worked on Kizaru, attacks worked on etc, etc. Does this count, or does this prove that Buggy is immune to all slicing attacks even if they have hockey abilities? My thoughts on this are very complicated, and most of them are in spoiler zone, okay. so ask me again in like 50 episodes. Okay. I don't want to spoil things too much, but hockey is a conscious thing once you learn how to use it. Um, Luffy's not there yet, but other people seem to be able to kind of turn it on or off. I assume that if Mihawk is fighting Luffy, he does not need to use the hockey. Why would you? You know, that's like, uh, y- you know, you... I, I can't even think of an example, but it's just, it's overkill. It's not necessary. So I assume that it was more he was surprised that Buggy appeared and that allowed Luffy to get away, then he can't cut Buggy. But just be aware that there are people, uh, I know one in particular on Twitter, who believe that Buggy is immune to all cutting attacks, even if the other person has the ability to negate Devil Fruits. I disagree with them until we get further information, but it's not impossible. And that has been your do 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 final thought. thought. Outro goes here. Thanks for listening, everyone. Next episode of the podcast, we'll be covering episodes 474 through 480, but also we'll be having a special guest for the first time on our main feed. Give a warm welcome to John from Paramecia Fancast once he's actually here. He's not here with us right now, but (laughs) next week, tune in for a very special treat. And the week after that, we have another guest lined up. They're not here right now either, are they? Unfortunately, it's just you, me, and... And the ghost of Colonel Jenkins. Bye! Ooh, I'm a ghost. Fucking bitch-ass Jenkins taking my thing. I'm the only ghost of the show. Ghost, fight, ghost, ghost fight, ghost, spooky! Ha ha! What a great episode of King of the What Now, your One Piece podcast that started from the very beginning and stars these two doofuses. If you want to follow us on social media, Twitter is the best place to do that. I am at K-O-T-W-N underscore pod. And I am at Pirate Ghost Host. Absolutely, yes. We share all sorts of thoughts on there, some related to the podcast, some related to other things. But you can also reach us through email at kingofthewhatpod at gmail.com, or you can also find us on Patreon. We would love some subscribers or supporters, whatever the technical term is. Patrons. Patrons. So fancy and grown up. Uh, And you can find that at patreon.com slash king of the what pod you can find all sorts of things like bonus episodes and you get to see the full cold open candidates not just the ones that make it into the episode maybe someday if i learn to draw i'll put stuff up there we're always looking for suggestions and feedback and speaking of which please take a moment to rate and review our podcast wherever you get us from so itunes spotify scrivener that's for writing but wherever you listen to our podcast take Take a moment to leave a review. It helps other people find us. We are so grateful to all of our listeners, and we couldn't do this without you. Absolutely. Word of mouth is super powerful, so if you have a friend who likes One Piece and they haven't heard of us, just direct them to the latest episode. And if they hate us, they can tell us why. And if there's an actionable item, we'll try to please you. That's how this works. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.